Well, uh, it's a, today's a Asian Studies doubleheader, first with the Thai ambassador, now with uh, Robert Griffiths, who's the Consul General for the U.S. Uh, consulate in Shanghai. Uh, I'm Eric Hyde, the Director of Asian Studies, and I will introduce Mr. Griffiths and uh, say, first of all, that we, since we already had prayer for the Thai ambassador, we'll dismiss with prayer for the second half of the Asian Studies <laughs> lecture series today. It's, it's rare we have two Asian Studies lectures on the same day, uh, both pushed to the afternoon for various reasons. Um, as I mentioned, Robert Griffiths is the Consul General for the Consulate Gen at the Consulate General in Shanghai, China. Um, he's a career diplomat with overseas postings in many places, including Bogota, Colombia, Thailand, Kaohsiung and Taipei, Taiwan, and Shanghai and Beijing, China, currently in Shanghai. Uh, he has also served in the Bureau of Economic Affairs as a Deputy Director for Mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, and also, he has worked in the Asia Policy Office of the Office of the Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon. And he also served uh, one year uh, in the office of U.S. Senator Harry Reid from Nevada, and Nevada is uh, Mr. Griffith's home state. Um, he speaks both Thai and Chinese, and he is married and has three grown children. So I'll turn the time over to you, too, Robert. Well, it's a pleasure to be back here. I uh, always enjoy coming back to the old alma mater and uh, seeing, uh, seeing the campus and how fast it's growing, and it's uh, really exciting to, to be a part of that in some small way. Um, let me uh, point out sort of the obvious to anyone who's even looked at a map that uh, China is a very big place. And there's any number of perspectives that you can take on China and they'll probably all be true, and they may not all be the same. But the perspective I'm going to give you is what I'm seeing in, in Shanghai. Um, Shanghai is the commercial financial capital of the country. It's, um, uh, our district has about 200 million people. I think we'd be the seventh largest country in the world or something if we were our own country. Uh, so it's uh, a lot going on there. And, I believe that it's a little different perspective than, I can, than you often will get from hearing in the press. If you just read the headlines about China these days, what are you likely to read? You're likely to read about unfair trade practices, um, how Chinese companies get an advantage by uh, getting government support, about how they're stealing our intellectual property rights, the difficulties of American companies uh, getting into China. You'll hear about human rights problems. You'll hear about Chen Guangcheng, the uh, blind activist you may recall who was in the news a while ago and the difficulties that he had. Um, people in China can get sentenced to labor right, to labor reform camp, which basically is a gulag uh, without any trial, just if the local security officers want to take care of a problem. You've got, uh, in recent uh, couple of years, a very aggressive regional policy, growing military capabilities, confrontation regarding islands in the East and South China Seas. And most recently, you've probably read about the cyber attacks that the Chinese PLA has been conducting on not only U.S. government sites, but a number of U.S. businesses as well. All that is very true, and those are very serious problems. I don't mitigate them. I don't... Um, uh, want to mitigate them at all, and uh, indeed, uh, a lot of attention is being played by the U.S. government to resolving all these issues. But to me, it's important also to see all those issues in a context, in the overall U.S. bilateral relationship. I'm concerned that if we only focus on those problems, we're not going to develop the kind of policy that we need toward China, understanding the broad ramifications that has for so many Americans in so many ways of life. When congressional delegations come from the United States to visit China, I'm particularly aware of how focused they are on the problems in the relationship. And again, their, their concerns are very real, but sometimes they miss that overall context. When we had a congressional delegation visit recently, for example, 
in order to help them get a broader perspective than the normal meetings that they would have that we would set up for them with the government leaders, with business leaders, and with academics, which is sort of the normal fare that they get, I wanted them to get a little bit deeper insights into what was really going on there. And so we set up a, a lunch and invited about 20 what we called America, interesting Americans doing interesting things in Shanghai. And it was, uh, it was, I think, an interesting program for them. We had people who are, these are all Americans, mind you, who are TV script writers for Chinese soap operas. We had fundraisers. We had chefs. We had people who were running non-governmental organizations, NGOs. We have doctors, hospital administrators, school administrators, teachers. We have entrepreneurs. My favorite is a guy who um, went to China not knowing any Chinese, but just felt like there was economic opportunity there. And he started a business selling cinnamon rolls out of his living room. And uh, he's now supporting his family with his cinnamon roll business. I mean, he's a real entrepreneur. And the response from the congressional delegation was, uh, uh, was remarkable. They said, I had no idea that this kind of stuff was going on. There are 50,000 Americans resident in Shanghai all doing these sorts of things. And he said, I had no idea that this was all going on. And then he said, anybody, and you've got to promise me that any other congressional delegations that come here, you're, you will do the same thing for them because they really need to see that. He recognized that they weren't getting that in Washington. Well, let's look at this relationship and see how broad and deep it really is. Let's just take stock of it a little bit. Look at what's really going on. In trade, for example, we do half a trillion dollars worth of trade with China every year. And sort of from the perspective of economic theory, when you think about the fact that trades only happen when both sides benefit, and look at the economic benefits that uh, both sides are getting from a half trillion dollars worth of trade every year, you realize that it's enormous. The benefits to both sides are just, just overwhelming, really. We uh, invest, the United States has invested $60 billion in China. I think that's a very small number, but when I went around gathering the data, that was the most conservative, because there's many different ways to count it, but a lot we've invested in China. China's investment in the United States is also growing very rapidly. Last year, they invested $6.5 billion in the United States. All that money that's being, that we've been funneling through Walmart to China is now coming back, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, there is a lot of concern in some quarters about Chinese investments in areas that we think are sensitive from a national security point of view. And there's a few cases every now and then that do get held up because of that. And those get all the press attention. But in fact, there are hundreds of projects that are approved and get uh, approval every year in the United States. And so you need to see it in that context. In education, I have yet to visit, and I visit frequently, Chinese universities all over eastern China. I've yet to find one that doesn't have some sort of program of exchange with the United States. And I'm also not aware of any American university that does have some sort of exchange program with China. BYU, of course, has extensive programs with China. And even the smallest campuses of colleges that you wouldn't even have heard of necessarily have something going on with China. 194,000 Chinese students are studying in the United States, at least they were last academic year, probably more this year. And there are thousands of American students, not that many, studying in, in China as well. In addition to that, um, the uh, universities are growing as well in terms of their presence on both sides. I'll mention in a bit some of the, the campuses that are growing, that are being established in China. The um, study of language is also binding the two countries together. All Chinese students study English as a part of their normal school curriculum up through high school and then in college as well. The demand for US teachers of English in China is huge. Anybody who wants to go to China, if you're a native English speaker, you can go and you can get a job. Every school at every level in China is looking for instructors. They have money and uh, there is a great appetite to learn English. 
Chinese programs in the United States are also expanding exponentially. I spoke with someone from the state of Utah, actually, in Shanghai recently, who claimed that there are more, a greater proportion of elementary students in, in, in Utah are studying Chinese than any other state in the Union. And uh, that's amazing. And uh, there's a great deal of interest on both sides in learning languages. In energy and environment, we have huge exchange programs, more than with any other country except Canada. Shanghai alone, we uh, have about 100 US scientists from the top national labs and universities who come to Shanghai every month. And they're doing exchange programs, joint research, research programs, and uh, in all aspects of energy and environmental cooperation. Travel and tourism. We in Shanghai have greatly expanded our own visa services. In Shanghai, the number of people who are applying for visas has uh, doubled in the past three years. The, and mind you, in the United States has to interview every single visa applicant, not like other countries that process them without a face-to-face -face interview. So the, the burden we have is quite considerable. We interviewed over 400,000 Chinese for visas last year. And uh, you know, do the math, that's a lot of interviews. But we are not shying away from it. We have added, uh, we've doubled the number of consular officers that we have. We are doubling our visa space to process them. And we, we welcome that. And uh, w all of our facilities in China, the embassy and the other consulates issued about 1.4 million visas to Chinese to come to the United States. And uh, about 1.1 million Americans went to China last year. Chinese visitor spending, spending in the United States by Chinese visitors, contributes about $10 billion to the US economy every year. And so there's an enormous impact on, on trade and on, uh, on jobs in the United States, job creation that that money ends up uh, going to. Um, in Las Vegas, if you spend much time there, and that's my hometown, so I hope you do, um, the uh, hotels now are focusing on Chinese New Year and the tourists that go there then, and uh, they're completely decked out as if you were in China. They've got all the red, uh, the red uh, lanterns and all the festivities there, and they really are catering to the Chinese market in a way that is phenomenal. On the government side, we have the annual strategic and economic dialogue plus 94 separate bilateral dialogues going on between the United States government and the Chinese government on a whole range of issues. Obama, President Obama met with Hu Jintao seven times in his first term, and that'll undoubtedly continue at a similar pace in his second term with the new President Xi Jinping. Okay, with that broad basis of, of what's really going on and the problems that we see that are challenging for us, consider this possibility, just think about it a minute. If the United States, with its democratic values, high technology, creativity, could work effectively with China across the board, with China's economies of scale, enormous human capital, and willingness to work hard, would that not be the greatest collaboration in history of enormous benefit to the entire world? Well, that's probably wishing beyond what is realistic, but just think about it. I'm going to share with you seven anecdotes that have come across my desk that gives you, I think, some insight into the potential and what we can do for each other. Right now, the highest, most modern and beautiful buildings that are being built in the world are being built in China. And uh, I, I wish I had a PowerPoint for this point because in Shanghai, there are four enormous structures. One you've probably seen is the Pearl Tower, that sort of globular thing that, that goes up. And there are also three very distinctive and very striking uh, towers, which are all taller than the, high, highest, the uh, Empire State Building. The um, tallest building in Asia is currently under construction there. Really showpiece uh, architectural things. And all over China, you get every city competing with each other to produce great architecture. 
the, the town, it's town, six million people, of Changsha in Hunan province is now committed itself to building the tallest building in the world. And uh, more power to them. But that's what's going on. But the amazing thing is all these buildings in Shanghai are built by American architects. And so you have this collaboration where they have the resources and the desire to build. We have the expertise to provide that sort of stuff. And working together, these buildings are getting built. The only building that I've seen that is being proposed for construction that is as striking as what I see in China, in the United States, is this new um, hotel complex that's scheduled for Los Angeles. And interestingly enough, the reason I know about it is because the people who want to build it are in China trying to get money to build it. And so that's where they're having to go to, to get the money. But again, it's a US designed building and will be very striking when it goes up. China, despite its enormous potential, enormous accomplishments in the past several years, in fact, has some very serious problems that it needs to overcome. One of them being a tremendous water shortage. The entire northern half of the country is a terrible water shortage, so that in 20 or 30 years, they could have exhausted their underground aquifers. It's a very serious problem. The biggest consumer of water by far in China, as in the United States, is agriculture. And basically, what we are doing now is we are exporting water to China to help alleviate their water shortage problems. We're not doing it in big tankers. We're doing it in the form of soybeans. Soybeans are an essential element of the entire food process because they provide feed for all the livestock. In China, that means pigs. And, that, uh, and we grow soybeans very well, and we export them to China. China gets its, ex its soybeans from places other than America, but we're the biggest supplier. China imports well over a million, a million tons of soybeans every week. And that's how we are exporting water to China to help them deal with that. That enables China to greatly raise its standard of living. The amount of pork in your diet is the single most significant indicator of standard of living in China. And that is made possible now by American soybeans. You've probably heard recently that there's serious air pollution problems in China. Has anybody heard of that? <laughs> it is truly awful. It is in, in Shanghai, the air is actually really bad, really bad. But because it's so much better than Beijing, we're all happy to be there breathing it. Um, well, General Electric has developed a new clean coal technology that is truly uh, path-breaking. It's uh, uh, very new and e extremely, uh, has tremendous potential. The problem is it's very expensive. And they shopped around to the big coal companies in the United States to see if anyone were willing to take this on. But the costs of tooling to get the equipment in order to put this technology into place is so high that it did not make any economic, it not, did not make economic sense for any U.S. coal company. So they go to China and, and um, join forces with Shenhua, which is the world's largest coal company. They do have the economies of scale to make such an investment worthwhile. So that is undergoing, uh, going on right now. When the tool dies and the machinery to produce this equipment is in place, of course, the cost of producing it will drop. Making that equipment not only available in China, but for export back to the United States and around the world. So this great collaboration to really have new technology to help clean up our air is only possible because, again, this wonderful marriage between U.S. technology and Chinese economies of scale. How many in here know much about plasma physics? Well, I don't either, but let me tell you what I do know. Um, actually, this goes way back. When I was a student at BYU, I was taken into an underground laboratory under the Eyring Science Center, which I didn't even know existed, and BYU was doing a cutting-edge new technology called a magnetic containment to produce fusion. 
Now this wasn't the cold fusion stuff from the U of U. No, 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 we're not talking about that. <laughs> this, 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 is, this is the real thing. Um, it didn't, you know, it, it's a very long-term development process, and I don't know if they're doing anything at BYU now, but um, that this technology has been taken over, and the leading labs are in MIT and in uh, Princeton, and in a place called Hefei, Anhui province in China. The tokamak reactor, and that's what these things are called, um, are collaborative events. And the tokamak reactor that was produced in Hefei was done largely by assistance from American scientists who went over there. Now, the reactors in Princeton and MIT contained the reaction. What the, you, you create a magnetic field that then forces the nuclei together, and that's the fusion that then releases heat and then potentially will be able to gener generate electricity when you get the technology right and you can sustain these reactions for a long period of time. Well, these, it, it, uh, the first generation of these tokamak reactors could contain it for maybe one, maybe two seconds. If you could get a two-second containment, that was quite a successful experiment. The tokamak reactor in Anhui province is running them for over a minute, which is... Uh, uh, you know, quantum leap up in the capability. Anyway, to go, make a long story short, not only are we cooperating on building these things, but right now the reactors at MIT and Princeton have been closed. And for now, if U.S. postdoc plasma physics students want to do their research, they go to China and they hook into this plasma physics reactor that we helped construct there. And thank goodness it's there or that we wouldn't be able to have our students go there. International education. The um, president of New York University, gone, a man named John Sexton, he has a vision that, uh, and in this vision, he says that in another generation, no one will think that they can get a bachelor's degree in a university just in one country, that the standard education will be between different countries. You will, you will study in different countries, and not just a sort of a study abroad program, but actually visiting campuses in the other countries. New York University, for example, has a new campus in Abu Dhabi that's been going for a few years, and, next, and this fall they will begin a new campus in Shanghai. Also, just west of Shanghai, Duke is opening a new campus. Just south of Shanghai, a university called Kane University from New Jersey is uh, opening a new campus. This is a, an American campus. It is an, the same curriculum, probably not as fulsome a, a selection of classes, but the same curriculum that they have in their home campuses back in the United States. The professors are American professors who have been brought over and they're teaching there. The only thing that isn't American is the fact that the Chinese built the facility to American specifications. It will be like attending university. You will get the same degree in China from Duke that you would in North Carolina. And this collaboration is enormous. Again, it's the American sort of software and Chinese money and hardware that are making this happen. How many have heard the country, company called Wanxiang? How many have heard of the Midwestern Rust Belt in the United States? <laughs> the two are related. Wanxiang is China's largest car parts manufacturer. And China, as you may know, is now the world's largest car market. More cars are sold in China than are in the United States. And Wanxiang is, um, is a private company. It began during the Cultural Revolution by a guy running a bicycle repair shop in Hangzhou, China. And he has parlayed that over the years into what is now this huge, huge conglomerate. Well, they are very interested in getting into the US market. They are going around the Midwest and did in the past couple, three years after the recession in the United States and many of these companies were going bankrupt. He would buy them up and keep them from closing and uh, infuse more capital and make them into going enterprises again, preserving these American jobs. 
It's been a challenge for Wanxiang. They had never before had to deal with the United Automobile Workers, and that was a, that was a, a, a hurdle for them to get over. But they, they did, and they learned how to make peace with the unions, and these companies are up and going now. Most recently, they purchased a new battery company that produces batteries for electric vehicles, A123, that's been in the news. And uh, again, they rescued it from bankruptcy and will keep that company going and keep all those American jobs in America. So all that money that we've been, again, pumping into China via Walmart is coming back to create jobs in America. Off the coast of Shanghai, there were about five little islands that they hauled in typical Chinese fashion tons of rock and dirt out and created one island out of them by doing land rec reclamation and built what must be the world's largest seaport. It has these, these uh, cranes for, you know, that pick up the containers just as far as the eye can see in both directions. It is just huge. I was visiting there and coincidentally there was a team from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency there. I said, well, fancy meeting you here. What, what are you doing here? I said, well, we are trying to introduce to them a new technology that is uh, environmentally friendly. Turns out that um, all ports around the world have a huge pollution problem when big ships come into port now, when they're going across the ocean, they use the cheapest possible fuel, which is also the dirtiest fuel, fuel oil, the bottom rung out of the, the uh, oil refineries. But it's dispersed in the ocean, and you know that's probably as good a place to burn that kind of stuff as if there is anyone. Well, when they get into port, they're still burning this stuff to keep the ship going while it's in port. And it's a tremendous pollution problem in all these harbors. So what these EPI, AP, EPA guys were doing was they were explaining to China how you can build a power plant with some cleaner energy and then run cables out to the port. And so when the ships come in, they just plug in to the electricity and they can turn off their engines and not pollute the port anymore. And this apparently is a pretty big deal for port operators to be able to have you know, clean water in the port rather than these, this terrible pollution. And I said, that sounds great, glad, but why are you here? Why are the U.S. taxpayers paying for this? And they said, ah, ah. They said, we introduced this technology in Long Beach and thought it was great, but we could not get the ship owners to retrofit their ships to do it because it was just too expensive. And if the only place they can plug in is in Long Beach, it's just not worth it. So if we can get China on board and have this technology available in China, their economies of scale plus the U.S. economies of scale will then change the calculus for all the ship owners, and it will be worth it for them to make the investment to put in this technology so they can do electric electricity when they pull into port. You know, again, it's this when the United States and China work together, the benefits for everyone can be enormous. Okay. Um, As I said in the beginning, China is a huge place. Everything that's going on is, is big. Um, you can have many different aspects of U.S.-China relations, but I've tried to share with you today what I think is an important dimension of it to appreciate the depth and the breadth of what's really going on between the United States and China. And uh, put, that, put all the problems that you hear, which again are very real, but at least in that context. Every week, 60,000 people across the Pacific Ocean between the United States and China, doing all sorts of things, as you can imagine. So I think that uh, as we move forward, if we can recognize the tremendous potential in the relationship and both sides can think more clearly about the benefits that uh, we can get if we work together, hopefully that will mitigate some of the challenges that we face. That's all I have to say right now. And I would love to take some questions or dialogue. Eric, what would you like to do?
Okay, give me the mic. Uh, 400,000 interviews. Was, it, was this China, the China, the, the whole or just in the Shanghai? Country? Just in Shanghai. So has, has the American government ever thought about how they would cut this down? Like people who have been here before don't need to be interviewed again. Interviewed once and you get multiple entries. Interviewed once and you can apply over the years. How do we cut down the workload? It seems like an enormous task that no other countries have to do. And I know China is extremely frustrated. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that, like everything else, it's a very complicated problem. It's, um, the particular issues involved here are, first of all, the need to interview everybody is driven right out of 9-11. That's where it came before then. We weren't doing it, not with everybody, and now we do everybody. That's a matter of legislation. We have no option to not interview everybody. We also have a problem with issuing multiple year visas, multiple entry, multiple year visas, because the Chinese are not, not so interested in reciprocating. And whatever we do will be on a reciprocal basis. Um, we are doing some things to try to lessen the workload. For example, now you can renew a visa if it is just after, we only issue them for one year. After a year, they can renew it for up to four years just by sending in the paperwork, because we've already got all their fingerprints, we've already got that stuff. And so we're mitigating it a bit, but uh, right now we still, uh, the, the numbers are continuing to grow and we are building like mad to try and accommodate that growth. Other questions, right here. Uh, Sky Herrick, International Nations. Um, Obviously, there's been a lot of tension lately in the region with North Korea, but also with um, America's push from Europe to the Pacific and a, a lot of just interesting security questions going on. So how, does, how do you have to, you've highlighted a lot of the economic ties that the United States and China have, which is very strong, but how do you see those playing out with the, the very tentative like security situation in the region? China is has a hard time believing that their rapid rise doesn't make us mad. They, they just can't believe that we really don't want them to not you know, grow and become powerful in the world. Um, our position, of course, is that, look, as long as people play by the rules, let the chips fall where they may. You know, we don't expect to be number one in the world unless we're the most competitive in the world. You know, that's, you know, we're willing to take that on. And if China grows and prospers, that's great. Anyway, so with that sort of a mindset over there, they look at, say, the pivot to Asia, and they think, aha, you see, they are trying to contain us. They're sending their military over here. They're, you know, going to do all that. Um, it's largely just misunderstanding. The so-called pivot to Asia isn't anything new. It's, um, it's a simple recognition that our interests in the world are shifting. And most of our trade used to be with Europe. Now most of our trade is with Asia. So is it any surprise that we would have a bit of a shift in other, our other resources to recognize that, that that change in our interests? It's not just economics and trade. I mean. I mean, all the examples I gave you, there's so much going on in every field more in Asia now than there, there was previously and, and really and with the rest of the country. What, um, what the Obama administration did early on was try to refocus the energies of the country after the wars in the Middle East to something that in their mind was more positive and going to be more beneficial to the United States, at least economically, in the long, long run. And that was greater engagement with Asia. And in Asia, China is the biggest player. Uh, but this is, really isn't a new idea. I mean, other people have figured this out before. Back in, I think it was 2006, but I could be off for a year, Secretary Rice moved something like 230 diplomatic positions out of Europe to Asia, mostly to China 
clearly recognizing the same thing, that that's increasingly where our interests were. And so this is, in a way, sort of a no-brainer. If you look at the military implications of it, um, first of all, the deployment of American troops is actually they're tending to move out of uh, Okinawa, where they were, and to Australia, to Guam. That's getting further from China, not closer to China. It just, for a variety of, variety of very complicated reasons, having to do with our s situation in Okinawa and other places, it just, it's a prudent thing to be doing. We are very interested in maintaining a robust presence in the region. We continue and will continue to have a keen interest in making sure that shipping lanes are open all throughout and around Asia. Um, our ally, Japan, is completely dependent upon oil and trade through the Malacca Saints and the Straits in the South China Sea, and they depend on us to make sure that that trade goes openly. Actually, every country depends on us to make sure that those sea lanes are open, including China. And so a lot of the concern that the Chinese have on these issues is misplaced. We are, we are rebalancing our assets, military and otherwise, to that part of the world, but it's not out of some nefarious realization that we need to contain China. We, we, we don't need to contain China. We just want to encourage China to play by international rules and norms, and that's fine. Okay, let's go over here first, and then I'll go there. All right, Zach Phillips, political Thanks. science. Um, so you talked a lot about Shanghai, and as you said, China is a really big place. So I'm kind of wondering if you could highlight the differences between a city like Hong Kong and Shanghai. Like, what are the differences, and should one city be more like the other, and how do we play into that? Um, <laughs> Hong Kong is a great place. Of course, it was a former British colony, so it has um, uh, a sense of rights that uh, doesn't exist on the mainland. And uh, even after reversion back to China in 1997, it has continued to enjoy, enjoy a, a set of freedoms and openness that is not enjoyed on the mainland. Um, it has, uh, it, it doesn't have full democracy, I guess you'd say, because the election process isn't, isn't uh, fully democratic, but it's, um, does pretty well in that regard. There are differing viewpoints expressed uh, politically and in, uh, in, uh, in other ways. Uh, religions, non-governmental organizations all flourish in Hong Kong. Uh, if you compare that with China, or with uh, Shanghai in particular, uh, because of the overall uh, policies that uh, are on the mainland, it's not quite as free, not quite as open. Uh, the government has, is much more controlling than in, it is in Hong Kong. Economically, on the other side, uh, from a, I, when I was a ge geography student here, here at BYU, I learned this concept, concept of hinterland. And Shanghai has a huge hinterland all up the Yangtze River Delta. Hong Kong lacks a hinterland because it's pretty much a city state. So if you wanted to plot out the economic trajectories, you, you could make a good case for that Shanghai is going to do better than Hong Kong in the long run. Hong Kong, of course, is very aware of this, and they are trying to specialize, find niches, provide services that the mainland can't, and still maintain their robustness economically. And they're doing a pretty good job. Um, the real question before China and Hong Kong and uh, the rest of the world, really, is how far China will go and how fast to liberalize its, its currency with lots of ramifications for trade and capital outflows and that. And if and when that happens, and it, it won't happen quickly or totally, it'll happen incrementally, but there's a lot of talk and a lot of good reasons why China needs to move in that direction. That action will happen in Shanghai. Uh, the Shanghai authorities are ready to go right now, and they're sort of waiting to pull the rest of the country behind them. When and to the extent that they do that, that will put them in direct competition with Hong Kong, which to this point has basically been the leader in sort of international finance that way because it, it has a, actually it has a fixed currency too, but anyway, <laughs> for, they've been able to, for their long history of connections and that, to be able to provide those services in a way that the banks in Shanghai have not yet been able to. 
Um, Shanghai is turned into a fabulous city. It has character, it has history, it has uh, adopted uh, a lot of uh, outsider influence. Most everybody is comfortable living there. It has an American feel, it has a European feel, it's, it's clearly Chinese, it's uh, got people from all over the world there. It's a real, growing to real cosmopolitan city and is really a place where you might want to put your money if you wanted to identify the great cities of the world into the future. Hong Kong is already a great city of the world, um, but it's hard to see how its trajectory can be quite as steep as Hong Kong or Shanghai. That's my personal view. I think we have one there and then we'll come up here. Dallin Chan, you're studying business strategy. Um, my question is, how is China responding to nor the developments in North Korea? And what implications does that have for China and Japan and South Korea relations? Well, um, sort of going back to the, the um, just to the basics on it, um, China does not want a hostile or potentially hostile or even potentially unfriendly presence on its border. So it wants North Korea to remain as a separate state to provide a buffer to South Korea where there are US troops stationed. It does not want that border to move up to its border. Probably even greater concern than that is they want to maintain uh, they, they are very concerned that if North Korea were to collapse from any scenario, military or otherwise, that they would have an unmanageable outflow of refugees into China, and they really don't want that either. So they have some very solid strategic reasons why they want North Korea to remain there. Now, that being said, it is an enormous headache for China to have Pyongyang behaving the way it is right now. And they repeatedly tell us, you guys think that we control those guys. We don't. Those, those guys are, well, I won't tell you what they say of them, but um, at <laughs> any rate, it's a big problem. And to sort of get to the, cut to the chase on the strategic problem, if South Korea and Japan feel genuinely threatened by North Korea, the temptation for them to develop nuclear capabilities would be reasonable, and that is something that China does not want to see. So they have to walk this tightrope between preserving North Korea and not allowing North Korea to so misbehave that they will spark an arms race in the region and it, and a, you know, an escalation of tensions and all that that they really do not want to see. So it's, uh, if you want a tough portfolio right now, you should have the North Korean portfolio in Beijing. Now let me step back a little bit and just remind everybody that North Korea does not have the technical military capability to do the kind of stuff that it's, it's saying it's threatening to do. It does not have that capability. Not to say that it's not a danger, not to say that they aren't irrational and could do crazy things, but, um, you know, they're not, they can't do what they say they're gonna do. And so most of this is, what's going on right now is there are annual military exercises between the United States and South Korea. We do them every year. We, they're important for our, our deterrent capability on the peninsula. They are important to reassure the South Koreans that we are there and we're engaged and we are going to stand by them should anything happen. And we do these every year. And every year, North Korea sees, sees this as a staging to attack them. And they complain every year. This year is a little different because they've, you know, they've had another nuclear test. They did launch a rocket and so they're rhetoric in terms of complaining about this going on is, has been ratcheted way up. And you've got this new leader who probably has uh, a great need because of his youth and inexperience to demonstrate domestically in North Korea that he's a tough guy. And so he's sort of leading this charge about making them look tough. 
And my personal, don't quote me, prediction is that when the exercises conclude, North Korea will declare victory and will claim that it was their standing up to the United States that got the United States and South Korea to, to back down on this military exercise. Um, it's for domestic consumption in North Korea, basically. But we're, we're taking it very seriously. We want to make sure that miscalculations don't happen, that they are, you know, there, if there was any doubt about the U.S. resolve, that it, uh, we put those to rest. Um, it's a very interesting situation. Okay, Lou, I know your name, but you better tell everybody else. <laughs> General Griffiths, Lou Kramer at the World Trade Center, Utah. It's so good to be with you, and congratulations on all you're doing, and what a superb representative you are for us overseas. We appreciate that very much. And I could go on and on about what a great job yeah, you're doing. Yeah, we get reports yeah, just, all the time. Just get to the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, I'm sorry for being a little late, but I don't know if you talked about Taiwanese and uh, mainland Chinese uh, political tensions right now, given all the, the uh, great business relationships going on and the, the risk that would en enhance, would be enhanced if there were any kind of tensions on the political side. Mm. Um, I've not talked about that. Um, but um, I think things are as good as they have been um, in the last 20 years, I would say, with regard to the mainland and uh, Taiwan relations. Um, business is booming. Um, I should have the figures in my head, but I'm sure that the uh, relationship that the, the Taiwans have with the mainland is their largest economic relationship, both in terms of investment and trade, if I remember correctly. And uh, they're well aware that it's a mutually beneficial relationship. There are probably a million Taiwans living in the mainland, uh, doing business, going back and forth. In very recent years, they have, um, there's now regular commercial flights between the two, and there never were before. There was a period when you could sort of go through Hong Kong and that, but now they're, uh, they're going over in droves in both directions. Uh, Taiwan is a favorite tourist spot for the people of Shanghai, and uh, you know it's, uh, it's on everybody's bucket list. And, and when you walk into the uh, Chiang Kai-shek airport in, in Taipei, you know, it's a big section for welcoming their you know, mainland uh, compatriots and uh, special visa arrangements, big tour groups. And again, their, their tourist industry is now probably dependent upon the mainland tourism. So things, things are, are as good as they have been in a long time. Now, um, it's always, uh, there's no real talk recently of the need to push for political reconciliation. So as long as that very contentious issue, controversial issue, can sort of stay below the surface, I think things will continue to go along very smoothly. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, my name is Steve Hendricks. Um, I'm a China hand. Come on. Can we say that? <laughs> um, uh, two, two quick just uh, comments, that maybe okay. you comment on and then a question. One is, um, one other element of the U.S.-China economic dialogue is that uh, we hear about a lot of the jobs being outsourced to China, but something that may not be quite as, as visible is the number of U.S. companies that have invested in China to penetrate the China market. Uh, for, for example, the KFCs and the, and the Starbucks and the McDonald's and and all the other companies, just to, to note there, that I don't know the numbers anymore, you used to track that, don't anymore. Uh, billions of dollars of investment have gone into China, uh, U.S. companies and some of those earnings are coming back here. Um, another uh, a quick note, um, well, let me just go to a quick question. I, on the North Korean thing, uh, it's been suggested that this, every time North Korea misbehaves, it sort of enhances China's role as a power broker. And uh, there are those in the Chinese government, maybe it's the other side of the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry, that think it's, uh, it's a helpful, it's a useful thing to have this misbehaving uh, neighbor. Um, and one thing that I know that maybe they don't call you a diplomat for nothing, but uh, when I talk to the taxi drivers about Korea, they think they're all nuts. <laughs> that was just a comment. The questions on North Korea as a power broker, or China as a power broker? Okay. Um, before I get back to that, let me throw out the statistic that uh, you may have been referring to. The Shanghai American Commerce recently did a study of all of its companies, and it's the biggest American Chamber of Commerce anywhere in the world in terms of the number of companies. I can't remember, there were like 
7,000 U.S. companies in Shanghai and another 6,000 in the neighboring conference, uh, uh, provinces. I think the image that most Americans have of U.S. investment in China is Americans go over there, build a factory so they can make use of cheap labor, buy, make stuff cheaply, and send it back to the United States. And that certainly still goes on, but not that much. In this survey, they found out that 60%, 60% of the American companies invested in China are there solely to sell in the China market. And only 17%, 17%, are in China building to, uh, making stuff to export back to the United States. So that's really a, it shows you the shift of what's gone on in our economic relationship with China in the past you know, 10, 20 years, because that's, that's it's huge. What's really going on, if I could just elaborate that a little bit more, is companies are simply global now. And the whole concept of you know, bilateral trade between the United States, every computer that comes into the United States from made in China has components made from all over the world. It's uh, the general track, you know, is the chips are made at Intel in California. They go to Thailand to get put in the hard drives. The hard drives are shipped to, you know, to, the, to China, put in the Dell computers, and then they come here. And it's just not very useful to look at the single bilateral trade figure and get a picture of what's really going on in the world. Companies are simply global. That's good, and it's bad. And uh, the, the bad part of it that all the students here need to remember is that it's a competitive world out there. You don't have to compete with everybody. And you can, that's the good news, is that if you get a good US education and are creative and hardworking, you are competitive and you know, make use of that. But uh, American is, America's got to stay competitive it's, if it's gonna do well economically in the world. Okay, to your second question. Many years, several years ago, decade or so, uh, a, uh, an arrangement was made called the Six Party Talks. And it was an effort to get North Korea to not develop a nuclear program. And the six parties were North and South Korea, Japan, Russia, China, and the United States. And they were hosted by China. And China sort of organized the meetings and got everybody together. And, and that's the kind of more internationalist bend that some in the foreign ministry would like to see China do more of. And, uh, but in terms of the current situation, I don't think that's working out very well. Um, nobody's interested, in, North Korea has said it will not go back to the six party talks and uh, the United States isn't real enthusiastic either. And the ability to, of China to sort of mediate this and be a leader to solve this problem isn't panning out very well. They, because of their own interests and, and dealing with, with uh, you know, a recalcitrant North Korea, and, uh, and, and frankly, a United States that is sick and tired of rewarding bad behavior by you know, going back to the negotiating table, it's a tough road to hoe. And, um, and they're not really stepping up and making this. So I don't think anybody today in, North, in uh, Beijing is thinking that this North Korea misbehavior is gonna work to their advantage in any way. Okay. Are we kind of, any other last questions? Or are we kind of out of time, Eric? Is there a last question? We have time for another question if there's one. I have one more, Robert. Just one. What's happening in Western China? I mean, Ambassador Hunt was yesterday. We've got to do more work in Western China. I know they're putting a lot of funding in there. We've got a lot of links to Western China. You guys are second tier state. We're not, you know, first tier kind of folks. Can we be more involved in what's happening in the Western part of that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, let me get to something that you implied in there. Utah's the second tier, blah, 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 blah. You shouldn't be thinking that way, seriously. Because in China, everything happens on the basis of Guanxi. I mentioned before, there's Kane University building a campus in Wenzhou, China. How many have heard of Kane University? You know, but because of the Guanxi that they established, which flowed out of a sister city relationship they had between Newark and Wenzhou, they now have one of the three U.S. campuses in China. So don't, you know, don't, don't think that you can't play in the big leagues. You know, you, you can. Utah can. Western China, which isn't to say that there aren't great opportunities in Western China. It is growing rapidly. Western China, mind you, isn't, 
you know, if you looked on a map, it isn't Western China. Western China is anything that's about 100 kilometers west of the coast on the east. And, uh, and uh, you know, in China, you talk about first-tier cities, second-tier th cities, third-tier cities. And, uh, you know, you think about that, you know, who wants to be a third-tier city, you know? And isn't that kind of demeaning? And, you know, I don't, we shouldn't refer to second-tier cities. And actually, this is a Chinese government designation and it has to do with the kind of development assistance they're going to get from the central government, the kinds of things that they can operate in. And, and so it's all extremely bureaucratic. But anyway, so you've got these second and third tier cities, which are the first tier cities are Guangzhou, Shanghai, and Beijing, and Tianjin, I think. Uh, and every, all the other big ones are, you know, second tier and then third tier cities. Enormous opportunities. Money has been going in, out there a long time. You, the, they're building and have built an enormous interstate highway network, just beautiful things. Uh, trees growing along them, bushes in the middle of the roads, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, because they have low cost labor and they can keep all that stuff up. And so you've got enormous road network, you've got enormous railroad network that's going in, the rapid, I mean, the whole th place is blanketed by trains already, but the high speed tra bullet trains that are going everywhere now, they are creeping their way, you know, past the 100 kilometer mark out into the west, and, uh, and uh, airline terminals, all these cities are getting brand new, beautiful air airports, and there are enormous opportunities out there for anybody. So even if you're not the guy who settles on Shanghai to run a cinnamon roll business out of your living room, you, uh, you can find opportunities in other places. Okay, thank you.